Now I'm, I'm very happy that Dietrich, who then from the EBI moved to Zurich, where he is currently with the University of Zurich, uh, I would like to welcome him again and uh, look forward to hear his talk about resolving phenotypes to standard representations, a complex task. The stage is yours. Anything for the introduction? Um, how do I switch forwards? Is there a trick how to move the slides? I think there was a remote for, yeah. So many thanks for inviting me to present my work here. It's actually a shame that it's my first time that I'm here. But at that time, in the past years, I was always so busy during this time that I couldn't come. And I will present uh, two things. One thing is work that I've done in the past, and the other thing is about the phenotypes. Um, I realized I only, initially I thought only talking about phenotypes because I think this is an interesting task for the future, and we have worked in this domain, and it's a complex task, so this is something which, where I believe that there's a lot of potential. But since I noticed that uh, this is maybe a little bit over the top, I put all the other things in where I've been working in the past to explain why I'm thinking that phenotypes is solvable and doable. And uh, so I give you a little bit an overview about the cortex mining I've done in the, in the past. This is main, mainly large scale entity recognition on the fly. One idea is that a lot of publications are not really publicly available and that's why we developed a solution which people could use from the outside with their publications. I will uh, give you an idea of this project, the Munting Enrichment of the Scientific Literature. There we integrated literature and biomedical databases. This is one of my core topics. I always look for reference data resources and try to bring them together, which is uh, um, at times difficult. And then I will show you, I've been working the last five years on challenges for large-scale entity resolution. I think this is um, already forward-looking. Uh, we have developed silver standard corpora. I think this is a very cool way how to bring together annotation solutions, align them, and then develop uh, corpora. And then I talk about the phenotypes to inspire you to do phenotypes for the next 10 years. So this is my time at DBI. Uh, this is the timeline. I worked at Line at uh, MLEBI. Now I'm at the University of Zurich. And I developed these uh, in the beginning, a lot of tools that started at line already. I took over the technology to the BI. Then I worked a lot on entity normalization, developing lexica and uh, using solutions to extract the information. Then comes the Cecil project, which is uh, the semantic web technology where I put up the claim that we can still have um, useful, um, interactive uh, Sparkle queries. And uh, this is the core cool work about the Silver Standard Copra. And I've uh, established the Journal of Biomedical Semantics, and I've developed a number of tools and solutions. And for the tools and solutions, the core engine is called What Is It? And it's, uh, it's an engine which um, allows to submit text and then identifies all kinds of entities. It's still quite popular. There's something like six terabyte of data transfer per month and 1,000 systems hooked up with this. Oh, 1,000 IPs, I say, so I'm not sure how many of them are systems. And this is uh, the solution where I'm best known for. It's a solution which identifies a lot of entities. And uh, so you submit a query, and then it generates a PubMed search. And from this PubMed search, it uh, runs it through a lot of modules. And these modules identify entities. And then it generates a table, which gives an overview over the content from the different publications. And um, these are the two challenges I've run over the last five years. This one is about annotating large amounts of biomedical entities, and large amounts means that we do one million um, Medline abstracts and annotate them with something like uh, six million entities. So this is publicly available, and this project is going into the multilingual domain, so we use the same technology to um, align uh, annotations in different languages and then build uh, parallel corpora on a larger scale. So I will be talking about big data today, so it wasn't mentioned yesterday too much, but I will make some reference to big data and smart knowledge. So big data is certainly big molecular data. So this is what you see when a biologist looks for data, then he is looking for all these, uh, for all genes, which is, um, can be, there's at least half a million terms for genes, half a million terms for species, and then the annotations which go with this. Then we have big laboratory data. So this is experiments where somebody does an, an expression profiling, and then and nowadays it's next generation sequencing, and then everybody wants to know how what the genes are doing. And then we have big, big uh, patient data, and this is what I will present later on. And literature data is large and complex. This refers to what Martin just said, the, the different Vs. Um, so there's a large amount of entities and relations. 
but you have heterogeneous type of content, uh, text graphs and images, and this is um, slowly developing to bring all of them together. And then we have information representation at different levels of complexity. So a biologist talks about a protein, but then thereafter he talks about this category of proteins, and then um, so he uses different language at different levels, and we use ontologies to, to, uh, to represent this. And, um, and there's no limitation on expressivity, so certainly when we have a paper, then, well, now, now um, arguing a little bit against the triple stores, even if a triple store is always right on most of the facts, there can't be yet another paper where somebody shifts the paradigm and comes up with completely different information. So the freedom of, of expression in uh, publications won't go away on the long run, I think. Okay, so the... Ah, uh, I have to go through. I don't see the red here. So this is... Uh, I give you a few examples where the problems lie, and I won't go into detail how to solve them. I, I've written enough papers on this. So one problem here is, and this comes more or less from what we have done in the KBC project, we took, uh, if, you, if you look at the publications that we are dealing with then, and the research which is done, then usually a researcher looks for one type of entity, like a chemical entity or a protein, and then he optimizes the solution, then he gets something like a 90% F score. But in reality, we have complex terms, so we have to do all the semantics. And uh, this was one um, question that we raised in the, in the KBC project. We looked into the question if we use different annotation solutions and we annotate a corpus with all the entities that are known, what do we find? Can we resolve these semantics? Can we generate something like a structure which represents all the different meanings? And only to resolve this one, we have a, a species here in the beginning. Then we have something like a chemical entity here. And if we add the term synthetase, then uh, aspartyl tRNA synthetase is a protein. And then if you add, um, add a gene to the end, then this is certainly a gene. Certainly, um, gene and proteins often used synonymously, but there are cases where you see a difference. But then all entities have to be resolved. And I haven't seen yet a single solution which does all of them, but uh, this is doable. And, but we have generated the first corpus where people can assess their solutions against. And then there's the other problems that we know from the language analysis. Again, I won't explain how to resolve them, but I give you an idea where the problems lie. So a couple of terms have different writing and then have different meanings. So mice is a species, and mice protein is, uh, is a, mice is an acronym for protein. Then we have the problem that you have something like a left breast cancer. And then uh, from the standard resources, we know something like a breast cancer, and we know something like a left breast. So this is anatomy, and this is a disease. And now the question is whether left breast cancer is different from right breast cancer. So we have a breast cancer, something which is pretty clear, probably the same, the left and the right breast. But then the survival rate may be different from the left to the right side. So this is open. This is, again, a semantic problem. And um, another question is uh, the typical ambiguity. So we have retinoblastoma, which is a disease and a gene. And uh, the question now, um, uh, whether we want to see this distinction, certainly this gene generates the disease, and uh, in some occasions it makes a difference whether this is the disease or the gene. And then here's a very special example, Streptococcus pulmoniae, which is a species, and then we have Streptococcus pulmoniae, which is a disease. So small morphological variants. And, and this is the solution that we have developed, and uh, we are exploring this uh, on and on and on. And we had two projects now using this. So what you see here is a term, which looks a little bit funny. It's the bovine virus disease virus. It really exists, so it's a true term. And you have uh, six annotation solutions. And they all find something different. They find bovine virus, which is a, a species. Again, bovine virus, the bovine virus, easy, some variability. Bovine, which is also a species. And then bovine virus disease, which is a disease. And then we have the bovine virus disease virus. And the question is now who is right? And to some degree, all the annotation solutions are right. So if you do the entities, then you more or less look at the boundaries of the terms. If you look for the semantic type, then somebody would have to mention or annotate this as a disease. The other ones are all a species. And then if you look at the concept identification, then we find that uh, people use different, or different systems use different annotation um, standards and then we get different identifiers. So we did this um, on one million abstracts and allowed different teams to annotate their entities. 
And then we used a method which did an alignment between all the different annotations. So we look for the left and the right boundary, and then uh, we more or less count how many of the entities have a, spe a special semantic type. And with a very lot of overhead, we can even resolve the, um, the concept annotation. So this is certainly the hardest part. But we generated uh, one corpus, uh, several corpora for um, uh, where the entities are annotated together with a semantic type. And uh, I've seen this now in other domains. And it's certainly quite a difficult solution. So you have a certain error rate when we do these annotations. And um, so this error rate is certainly leading to the result that solutions which are trained on it um, have a lower performance than if they are trained against a uh, gold standard. But you can also show that you can train solutions which take into consideration all the annotations for the different semantic types and the different uh, uh, boundaries, and then can perform better than any other solution which has taken part in the competition. So you can show that if you do um, generate this corpus, the silver standard corpus, you can train solutions which have a capability which goes beyond any other solution which has been developed so far. And the performance gap, if you have, the performance gap is about 10%. So if you have a gold standard, and then you have a solution which has been trained against the gold standard, and you test it against the silver standard, the performance gap is 10%, 12% on average. Okay, so my ambition lies in the semantic interoperability. So I've spent a lot of time in getting, um, in aligning the resources. And these are more or less the, the key elements that you require to, to achieve this. You need normative resources like terminologies and ontologies. We all use them. Uh, we need solutions for identifying concepts, statistics, machine learning, and natural language processing. So this is also more or less standard. We provide large-scale corpora now. And, um, and the way how we used it is, on the one side, we annotated entities on a large scale in a large corpus. But we also used the same approach going across different languages. So we used um, corpora in different languages, German, French, Spanish, English, and Dutch. And then we allowed, again, challenge participants to annotate them in, with, the different, with their systems. It's all biomedical terms. They came from Sonoma CT. And then we used the same alignment method and then cross-evaluated across the different languages. And, um, and this is required to open the door to do multilingual patient records. And here's a comparison of what we call a gold standard and a silver standard. So gold standard is uh, mainly built by hand, costly and time consuming. It's small sized, about uh, 1,000 documents in general. The question is, what do they represent? So each gold standard has his own flavor, I would argue. And I've written a paper about this for protein annotations. And it's centered around a single topic. And it's optimized for one to three human annotators, and what we call a silver standard is built automatically. It has a large size, one million documents. It can be quite diverse from the domain topics, and it's optimized for four to 30 annotation solutions. And um, so you can argue now for one or the other, but this is something that we have established. Okay, so here is the, the last challenge that we have run. Only to give you an idea about big data for um, gold standard corpora, or for silver standard corpora. So it was the clever challenge. And um, we were focusing on different types, diseases, species, and phenotypes. We were focusing on parallel documents, Medline, EMEA, and EPO patents. Then we used the languages English, German, French, Spanish, and Dutch. Then we used different techniques. So this was the most interesting thing. So we allowed, we didn't say, uh, we, we, we put up the challenge and said, you have to find entities in the different languages. But we didn't say which languages you have to deal with. And we didn't say what technology you have to use. And this was the most interesting thing. So some people did a code training going across the two languages. Others used translation methods. And again, others just used the terminologies and um, and then you can, uh, you can show that a machine learning approach which didn't use any natural language processing was, was doing equally well on particular languages than, for example, a statistical machine translation method. So this was as a large scale, several hundred thousand documents or units, several one million annotations, one million term candidates, 
And uh, so this was funded by the European Commission and uh, was a very interesting approach. Okay, uh, big data, smart knowledge. So I've shown you that we, I did annotation solutions on a large scale, I developed tools, and we developed Copra on a large scale. So where do I see now this difference between big data and smart knowledge? And um, so big data is the easy part, so we have 25 million Medline abstracts, um, about 3 million open access full text documents, so this is uh, quite big, and the number of journals are still increasing, the number of publications still increasing, even the speed of publications is increasing. There's still a big demand to write papers and to publish them. Then we have, from a different domain, 20,000 discharge summaries per year in a large hospital, so it's 100 per day. And these documents are precious information. So this is reporting about a patient, which treatments he's received, which disease, and uh, what problems to expect the next time he would come back into the hospital. The patient gets about 20 drugs on average for a standard visit in a hospital, 20 drugs. And if you take these 20 drugs, each has side effects, and if you take these side effects, then you want to know where, what, why this patient now has this side effect. So this is a problem where a medical doctor would go back to the discharge summary, and then he pulls it out of the archive and tries to read it, and he's already so tired because he has been dealing with all the patients that he doesn't have the time to find out. And the hospitals are interested in even giving the patients more services, so if a patient comes back into the hospital, then this is already known. It's already known that a drug and a treatment may be a particular problem for this patient. So somebody wants to read these discharge summaries. And then we have 24,000 genes, and uh, well, not a big number, it's pretty, pretty finite, but if you want to figure out for a single patient whether he has a problem with one or the other gene, then you still have to look up a lot of data. So now the smart knowledge side. So if you know the genes of a patient, we want to know the phenotype. We want to know what is this doing. So the patient comes into the hospital, he has a certain disease, and now I want to know whether he has special uh, peculiarities. I think, uh, um, and then a typical problem is the, the gene, there's a certain haplotype, so this is the kind of the snips of the patient, and then the patient has a slow drug metabolism, so the drug functions longer, and he gets more side effects. So we want to know these patients. We want to read it from the discharge summaries, whether this is already known. Or you have a group of women who are maybe known in one hospital or several hospitals. They have heart attacks at a young age, which is a little bit surprising. And then they've all taken the same contraceptive. So this is not an invention by me. This exists. This is, has happened for a contraceptive of Bayer two or three years ago. And uh, then a molecular function is core to a disease and seems to be re regulated by a drug. So we have a patient, we have a lot of data in the hospital, and then the discharge summaries describe what the patient had, and we have a couple of problems that we want to discover. And um, so this is, is a diagram how we would like to work on this data. So this is conceptual. So we have genes, we have diseases, and we have kind of reference data resources which we would like to use. Literature is one of this. So we want to know, um, so here's one database which you may not know or not know, OMIM, it's the standard database of diseases. It says something like this disease is linked to this gene. And then we have the same for mouse. There's a database where mice are analyzed and then they are changed genetically and then we find which gene is linked to which disease. But we also have the literature. So this is exactly what Berendt uh, presented yesterday taking all genes and all diseases that are known, uh, referred together in the literature and filtering this information out. So the Cecil project was using some of this information, and I come back to this later. And, but a more complex diagram would be like this. So we have the gene and we have the human phenotype, and then we know that there's some kind of gene has some kind of function, and this links to some kind of phenotype or we have a gene which is involved in some kind of pathway and then leads to a phenotype, and then, or we have a protein-protein interaction which induces a function. So this is also behind the graphs which we have seen yesterday. And we would like to use all the entities for these different categories and then put in into a machine the number of genes, then we do some calculation, and then we find out what phenotype comes out in the end. Or we would like to do the inverse we have a patient who has a certain disease and has a phenotype, and now we do the reverse calculation. We look for all the functions where 
the patient with this phenotype in his genes, this function and this pathway is involved. And this is information you find in the literature. So the use scenarios um, between genes and diseases. Um, so link genes to diseases. This is what I've shown you just on the diagram before. Um, this is actually the Cecil project already. So here we were looking for diabetes mellitus, a pretty disease where a lot of people have the disease. Then we want to look for the genes. And then we did something very special. So we looked for the genes and their Go terms. And everybody who knows Go knows that these are the functions. So this is exactly what we have here in the diagram. We have a gene, and then we have a function, and we have a gene and a pathway. And these are given by the gene ontology, and, by the, um, and the gene ontology serves here as a semantic resource for normalization. And we have a method to find those Go terms. There are several met methods published. We have them on method two. So we look for the genes, we look for the, the Go terms, we would like to look for the phenotypes, and um, then we link the genes to the diseases by the functions or also by other data resources. And this is how we, how we do it. So we, take, uh, we look for the disease in the, in the text, then we look for everything that is a function and generate a profile vector, then we look for everything that is a gene independently from the disease, also look for the functions which are in the text, and then we measure the similarity between both of them, and if the similarity is high, we have the gene for the disease. There's other methods, but this is one of the methods which is uh, working to read out which gene belongs to a disease, and then we can look at the genes and look at the diseases that we get, and we were able to show that if you give this a curator, and he tries to look up whether this, is gene, this gene is linked to this disease, then in 63 cases, 63% of all cases, he can confirm this relation. Even if this relation is not known in the, database, in the reference databases. So here's one example. SCN5A is linked to the, was linked to the short QT syndrome. This was the result of our analysis. And then you could read from the literature that it's linked to the long QT syndrome. And it's assumed that the long QT syndrome is the same or similar to the short QT syndrome. QT syndrome is a special condition in the heart where all of a sudden the um, uh, excitation of the heart is dis disturbed. OK, so the Cecil project, um, we use the technology which I've shown you. So we had, as project partners, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Glaxo, Unilever. It was really cool because um, pharma companies have a problem to talk about what they are doing their research on. It's a lot easier to work together with several of them because then they can talk about what everybody knows. And then we had several publishing companies, Nature, Elsevier, Royal Society of Chemistry, Oxford University Press, and Biomed Central. And the task was to go through the literature and look for the genes which are linked to diabetes, but to integrate them also with um, the reference databases and to build a Sparkle endpoint. And uh, so the idea was, and this may be a little bit surprising, to make a triple store okay, but to make this all public, which is surprising. So the publishers were agreed to this. I will come to this in a minute. And then we had a couple of side tasks. We had to build a graphical user interface on top of it and RESTful services. And here's again the diagram. So we use, looked for the genes and the diseases. So the disease was only one, was diabetes. We looked in the literature, full text from the publishers for everything that is linked to diabetes. We looked into the reference database, OMIM, uh, for diabetes and all the genes. We looked into a gene expression database, which we had to integrate. And then we put everything together. So we pulled out from the documents uh, triple statements, from the existing databases, also triple statements, and then made this available in a Sparkle endpoint. And this Sparkle endpoint was accessible through a browser, but also through a Sparkle client and through RESTful services. And this is what I said yesterday. We also had the trouble with the, with the scale of the data. And this, the problem is the size of the database, and I'll come to this in a minute, but also in the complexity of the data. So the more relations are in, the more difficult to query. 
And um, so a simple rule is, if you have a very simple database schema here, let's say only one relation or two, it works, even on a large scale. The moment you become more complex, it doesn't work anymore. And the clue was here, so in our case, we had a rather complex data representation. So what we did is, and it didn't work in the beginning, so we optimized everything for the graphical user interface. So we said the key queries are this one, two, three, four queries. This is the ones that everybody wants to see immediately. And then we shaped the data resource, which is easy, exactly to these queries. And then all of a sudden, the performance was OK. And uh, while well, I know that your data is a lot bigger, so it's, uh, you have to generate a lot of queries here, and this may be, but it's very interesting if you go to these semantic web conferences and you go into one room, and then you have all these triple store providing a yeah, billion data, no problem, we do it scales easily, fast performs, and show all these papers, and you go into the next room, which is biomedical semantics, and they say, oh, it's so complicated, really difficult, and we cannot perform it. And then you go back into the first room and say, please give us ontologies, we need ontologies, we want to have really complex data. And you go into the next room, oh, ontologies don't scale, and very interesting. So there's a little bit of an academic debate. And this was even in 2010, so I'm, I think it's unresolved. So this is the amount of data that you are dealing with. So it looks not very big, but it's already significant. I think this part is the most interesting. We analyzed the full text literature and pulled out uh, metadata, gene annotations, disease annotations, function annotations, and it's always in the range of several million. And then we used um, one reference database for, pro for proteins for humans, 12 million. So we ended up in the range of uh, 36 million. And then, um, again, coming back to the publishers, um, there was one publisher who didn't want to see all his data in the public, but the other three agreed, so you can now guess which one it was. And, uh, but we ended up with at least a solution of uh, 14 million um, uh, triples which were then delivered to the public. And this is then the, the results. So this was the interesting bit. So I said we were looking for new genes, and this is a typical diagram. So every, every number here is a gene which is linked to diabetes. So there's a, a, a right part, which is pretty boring. So this is OMIM. This is the reference database where all the candidate genes for diabetes are known. So these are all the genes which are uh, boring. Uh, you may do research about it, but not really exciting, nothing new. This part, too, this is everything linked to diabetes. Then this part is interesting. So these 19 down here, so we found 19 uh, genes which are coming from the literature. So somebody was having some issue about diabetes and these genes. They are not in the reference databases uh, for diseases, not in the reference database for proteins, but they are in a reference data resource where gene expression was observed. So somebody did an experiment in pancreas uh, cells and found that these genes are um, involved. So these are the 19 genes which are the outcome out of this two-year project with eight companies involved. And I can assure you, in every meeting, we talk about the business model for about two years. Um, and this is the list of genes, so I don't go through them, but this is the, the number of genes which are relevant. And I can make an argument for one or the other, but um, OK. So now this forward-looking thing about the phenotypes. So this is something I've been involved over the last three or four years. So this shows you where the field may be going. Something. This is the last missing link in the biomedical domain to do truly translation medicine. So I will explain you what a phenotype is. Um, I won't explain how we extract them. They use the standard techniques like uh, pattern-based, rule-based, but also statistical methods, machine learning. And the performance is not yet very good, so we are in the range of something, somewhere around 70 75%. And, but I argue that uh, everything that we do on phenotypes, we are still the, the resources around it are still not big enough. But I show you what you can do with phenotypes. So a phenotype is, um, uh, sorry, so this is, um, so the, we have again the phenotypes as, uh, an, you can characterize model organisms with the phenotypes. So the typical example is a mouse, and you can uh, change a mouse and then measure the performance. You want to assess medical patients with uh, phenotypes. In the end, we work towards translation medicine. We want to judge a patient or a drug against the findings of biomedical research. 
So the typical question is the patient has a particular um, uh, issue and then um, by knowing his genetic profile, go back to the uh, biomedical research and then find out where, uh, why this, how this can be explained. Um, so a phenotype is an observable trait. So I think you all had biology in school. And it's induced by a genotype and the environment. So increased size of a muscle, for example. Then it helps us to understand why, what a genotype is doing or what a treatment is doing. And um, it may look quite different between mouse and human. So mouse and human are very similar, 96%. So, well, you all know how a mouse looks. And genetically, a mouse is pretty similar to a human. But so, um, so these 4% difference is, uh, is uh, some trouble. And, uh, but still, it's the closest we can go. So here's one example. I, I took an example which is not so obvious, the phenotype aging, only to explain what complexity we have. You all know aging. According to Wikipedia, it's the accumulation of changes in a person over time. So aging is not a disease, but it's changed, it can be changes, it can be the result of changes induced by a disease, for example, a heart attack. It's not a process, but the changes could be induced by any process. The changes are neither positive nor negative. So aging is something where we are in a kind of a development which is um, changing the body, but we don't know whether aging is, well, we all believe that aging is negative, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, something where for the single steps, you cannot judge whether a single step is positive or negative for it. Okay, then it's the status as a result of, of changes. So we know when we are aged or old or whatever, but we don't know what a single step of which brings us closer to aging. Is it a phenotype? <laughs> so all the symptoms which are linked to aging are phenotypes. So uh, all the changes to the expression of the functioning of the body. But overall, aging is a very difficult phenotype. So we can define the components and parts, but um, it may not be so simple to define aging as a, as a phenotype. And this, is, uh, this stems from a paper where we have thought about what makes a phenotype. So this is the nuclear elements that we have defined, which goes into text mining and information extraction. So there's a physical object like a liver, organ, muscle, brain. There's a qualitative thing, which is the increased size of a muscle, the decreased size of a muscle. And there's a functioning like the heart, heart pumps blood. And there's biological processes like uh, the metabolism of uh, glucose. So we argued that these four components make up the phenotypes. And I believe that every text mining solution for phenotypes would go for this. And so here are the examples, increase, decrease size of an organ, and then increase or decrease of uh, functional physiological or metabolic processes, <laughs> then <clears throat> existing or missing structural components, so for example, an abnormal connection between vessels, and uh, molecular abnormalities like abnormal <laughs> enzymatic activities. And uh, here's a couple of examples linked to aging. So an older person has a reduced um, oxygen perfusion of the brain, reduced metabolic functions like pre-diabetic conditions, and then changes to the body structure like lost elements, hair, teeth, and kidney. Hair is a good example. So losing a hair is not really aging, but having less hair is an aging problem, but even being bald is not an aging problem, maybe um, so. Okay, so this is... Um, what we are after, and then there's different resources which can be analyzed, so you can take text resources. This is where we would look for the individual elements. Then you all know the terminologies. There's a couple of terminologies which are available. They are all not complete, so it's, uh, it's still very difficult to use uh, standard resources. So SNOMED is a good example. And SNOMED administration of a drug doesn't mean that the patient takes the drug. It means that a nurse goes and gives the patient the drug. It's a difference. So SNOMED is not really, well, everybody's complaining about SNOMED, but um, we would like to see different solutions. And then we have ontologies. And um, so if we compare them, the text has to be mined and uh, is, um, is less structured. And an ontology <laughs> is more structured, but um, but maybe not as explicit about the patient as we would like to have it. 
And so back to my diagram. So what we can do is for all these categories, we can pull out these ontologies. And this is what I said in the beginning, that we use reference data resources. So we can take for the phenotypes these reference data resources. And there's a couple of problems that have to be solved. So here we have, again, human and mouse. So we can find in human and mouse hearing loss. So this is easy. So we can compare human and mouse against each other. But then some of the terms are more complex. So we have progressive child hearing loss in human. And in mouse, we have abnormal hearing physiology and abnormal ear physiology. And we can have completely different terms in like optic nerve hypoplasia and uh, mouse abnormal uh, optic nerve morphology. So if you want to use these de reference data resources, then we can compare between the different organisms, between the uh, human and mouse. And, um, but still, if you look in these ontologies, then human is concerned with special childhood disabilities, but mouse is concerned with experimental understanding how a mouse functions. So there's a uh, semantically or from the continent quite a difference. And we can use, um, figure out how SNPs have an effect on the phenotypes. We can analyze complex phenotypes. And, but in the end, we want to read the patient records. And that's why um, I have here a slide um, how, how we would analyze it. So the patient records contain the information about the patient. Then terminologies are available, even if they are not sufficiently big. And this is developing. <laughs> And then we can use the standard text mining methods to filter out the features. And, um, um, and then we can try to compare the patient record against the scientific literature. So this is something where I see a certain potential, but I haven't seen any solutions yet which go this direction. Um, OK, so from the patient record to the patient profile, we read the patient record, generate the, the, the profile, and then compare it against uh, standard data resources. Um, here's an example how two ontologies would be aligned with, uh, again, methods which compare either the concepts or the structure. And um, then I have shown you the different resources which go to the different parts of the, of the phenotypes, and then they can be compared against the standard data resources. OK, so. Um, what I see coming is that the content for the um, patient records is available increasingly in electronic form. And certainly the means to process the data is there. But there are still problems of multilinguality and, and information which is not as explicitly in the text as we would like to see it. I give you three last scenarios. So um, phenotypes is complex. I'm arguing that um, this will be certainly a very important domain. And I believe that the tools and means that we develop here will play an important role here. But um, it may take another five or 10 years to get this really organized. Um, so what can we do with this? One thing is um, to help medical doctors. So you take a patient record, then identify parameters which hint towards organ failure or some kind of um, dysfunction and provide this to the medical doctor, so slow metabolism and uh, side effects of drugs. You can take the side effects of the patient and align it with the standard side effects of drugs and then propose whether a drug has induced this effect or system medicine is kind of on the wake. So you use a model for a disease which proposes some kind of phenotype and then check this against the phenotype of the patient. OK, so all together, while I was making a case for the semantic resources, I've certainly worked a lot on semantic resources as reference data resources. I think this is mandatory. Then processing of large data volumes in real time is not anymore the problem. So I still remember in 2001 PSB <laughs> when a researcher was proposing to process a sentence in 10 seconds and which takes about um, three or four years to process Medline then. So nowadays we have a lot more compute power. Semantic integration is still a difficult task. And even for the patient data, we will have numerical data which we want to map semantically. Then profile comparison statistical methods will be applied. 
So the patient data will certainly be integrated with molecular biology and genetics in the future. Many thanks. Thanks a lot.